Father Larry, this is chapter 4 we're working on in John's Gospel. So uh, we left off with a survey of the history of the Samaritans, of the split or divide or divorce between the north and the south, uh, the ten northern tribes, and the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Now, um, let's uh, pick up there. Um and start talking about uh, this exchange now between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. It starts off with him saying, give me a drink. Uh, that comes off a little rude. What exactly did he say to her? You know, you don't get the impression. I mean, she's offended. I don't know if she's offended, but she's certainly surprised to see a Jew addressing her who happens to be not only a Samaritan, but a woman and a sinner. Um, so she's triply amazed uh, that our Lord would address her. doesn't come across that uh, she feels as though he addressed her in a rude fashion. We can assume that our Lord did not. Um, you know, what does this remind you of? Well, what does uh, in Genesis 24, you see... The Eleazar is the uh, servant of Abraham who goes to fetch a bride for Isaac. And he meets Rebekah at the well. So, you know, we have, I don't know if I mentioned that yet, but we got a lot of wells. And it's a, it's a, it's a place to go to meet women who usually are around the home. And it's hard to get to them. Uh, if you want to meet them, you go to the watering hole. Um, and this is where we got, uh, Abraham's servant, Eleazar, who we think it is, okay, if you go back to chapter 15, verse 2, he's mentioned as being Abraham's heir at one point, Abram at that point, uh, is, uh, lamenting the fact that he's got no son yet, and, uh, he's telling God, look, I'm gonna have to have Eleazar, my servant, uh, become my heir. What's up with that? Anyway, that's um, when he tells him to look up at the sky and stuff like that. Um, so then he puts him in a deep sleep. And all right. But in chapter 24 now, the same guy, presumably Abraham's servant, uh, sends his uh, servant, Abraham, Abraham, at that point, his name has been changed in chapter 17 to Abraham. So he sends Eleazar of Damascus, this guy, and sends him to find a wife for him. So he goes up there and uh, wants to find a nice wife for him. So what does he do? He's got 10 camels, first of all, and he goes to this well and he says to himself, when I go to this well, I'm going to ask for a drink. And if this woman not only gives me a drink, but also volunteers to water all my camels 10 camels okay then she's got to be the one so it's kind of like a little test so he makes up his mind to do this and then he uh finds rebecca there this beautiful woman a virgin whom no man had known a bethula in greek is his, his virgin in the strict sense okay and i uh, says a little more politely than just give me a drink of water you know, in the English, uh, it sounds a little abrupt, but uh, Eleazar says to Rebecca, pray, give me a little water to drink from your jar. And she, she lets him drink, drink, my Lord. And uh, then she says, I will draw for your camels, too. Now, I did some math on this and researched this a little bit, but 10 camels. All right, let me go through this now. Camels camels 10 of them you know they can drink like 30 gallons at a sitting a camel they can drink 30 gallons a piece that's kind of mind-boggling check it google that and you'll see all right so 10 times 30 is 130 so 130 gallons uh, so 8.3 pounds per gallon. 
So times 130, that's 1,079 pounds of water. Not to mention the weight of the bucket. She's got to add, factor that in, whatever that weighed. All right, this woman is shred. She is buff. She's a strong woman uh, to find for I, Isaac. Isaac, who kind of stays home with mom. And uh, so, you know, Esau was the tough guy who was out hunting and stuff like that. Uh, but Isaac stayed at home with, uh, with his mother a lot. Um, so, man, Eleazar finds a strong woman to mate up to uh, poor Isaac. Uh, Isaac, who was a really holy, righteous guy. Um, but that's just impressive. Uh, Rebecca literally means to tie or bind. Okay, so maybe tying the knot is kind of like, well, it's related to the name Rebecca. Um, interesting little factoid, but look, uh, the apostolic work that this Samaritan woman is going to do, to my mind, seems like what Rebecca did in watering Isaac's camels, okay? She is going to go into that town and bring the whole, all these townspeople out to our Lord who's really thirsting for our souls like he did on the cross. I thirst. You know, Mother Teresa would always put that in every house she established. And I've been to her houses and they have the crucifix and then over top of it, those simple words, I thirst of our Lord from the cross. So this is all about the thirst of God encountering our thirst. We'll read a catechism quote that talks about that. But um, so a lot of uh, these fortuitous meetings um, between uh, spouses at a well. So you got uh, Rebecca and Isaac, you know, Abraham's servant, Eleazar. He finds a wife for Isaac at a well. And then fast forward to Jacob. He finds Rachel at a well. And then Moses finds Zipporah uh, at a well. So a lot of these meetings. So, yeah, when you hear well and Jesus there meeting a woman at a well, you can't help but think of this um, history, in biblical history. Now, she, so he asks her for a drink, and she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? Interesting, because she's going to, first she's going to call him a Jew. Uh, then she's going to shift and call him uh, Lord, or Sir, it's translated usually, but it's Kyrios, okay? Um, doesn't necessarily mean God, okay, in the biblical sense, but it's a term of respect. So she goes from calling him a Jew, to calling him Lord, then she calls him a prophet, then she calls him Christ, and lastly, all the Samaritans come out and say, truly, indeed, you are the Savior of the world. So we see an interesting progression there. Now, how is it you're going to speak to me, who am a Samaritan, a woman, and a sinner? And Jesus, she recognizes as a Jew. How is she able to tell that from what he's wearing? probably has the four tassels that you hear about in Numbers 15. Okay, this is an important passage. This is actually a passage that's included in the, uh, you know, what the Jews say every day. Okay, um, the, um, what's wrong with me? Uh, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Okay, um, what's that called? Um, the, um, uh that's irritating. Uh, the Shema. Uh, Shema, O Israel. Uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, this, this is a passage that is part of the Shema. So this is absolutely central to uh, the Jewish spirituality. Uh, is to wear tassels on their the four corners of their outer garment. Speak to the people of Israel and bid them to make tassels on the corners of their garments. So the kind of theme the corners. Um, and uh, so uh, on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and put upon the tassel of each corner a cord of blue and it shall be to you 
a tassel to look upon and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart. So this is what our uh, people were grabbing the corners of our Lord's garment, these tass tassels, the crespidon uh, in Greek, okay? These tassels at the kanafim, the corners. Ah, uh, the tzitzit is the Hebrew word for these crespidon, these tassels at the corners, the kanafim. Yeah. Yeah, um, and they were healed, and uh, which relates to Malachi chapter three, chapter four, verse two, where the people, um, the son of justice will come with healing in its rays. Okay, it says it's translated rays, but it's sometimes translated wings, but it's really corners. Uh, for you fear my name, the son of righteousness shall, shall rise with healing in its corners and it's kind of theme ultimately um and at these corners of the garment so very powerful to think our lord's healing power went out from him uh people were trying to grab these tassels of his garment um and she sees these tassels that he's wearing these blue there's a blue cord uh mixed in there and that's how she's able to tell that he's a Jew, all right? And <clears throat> presumably, uh, he's a Jew for crying out loud. St. Paul says in uh, chapter 9, verse 5 of Romans, to them, the Jews, belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Clear reference to Jesus' divinity, Romans 9, 5. But according to the flesh, he's a Jew. So she's a accurate, you know, she knows a Jew when she sees one. And, and uh, now, uh, what does our Lord say next? He says, uh, if you knew who you were, if you knew the gift of God, the Holy Spirit's often called the gift of God. And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So she responds, you know, where are you going to get this living water? I mean, she's thinking flowing water. Zoe, the word for living or life, and especially spiritual life, uh, versus bios, which is just kind of physical life. But, uh, you know, she, this is also a term that describes flowing water, okay? Uh, so she's thinking of this in terms of, um, you know, some sort of... Uh, I don't know, spring of some kind that he's aware of. I mean, that, she's thinking on an earthly level. And so often is the case. People don't understand our Lord when he says things. Okay. Um, you know, like uh, cleansing in the temple. You know, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it again. Uh, or he says to Nicodemus, unless you're born of water and the spirit, um, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And he thinks, what do you mean? I got to crawl back up into the womb? Okay, uh, this is often the case. She doesn't understand him here. The apostles are going to show up in a minute here. And uh, he's going to tell them he already has some food. And they're like, what is he, got a bag of raisins in his pocket or something? Like, how did he get food? Somebody bring him something? He's like, no, my food is due to the will of him who sent me. So our Lord is constantly misunderstood. This is a Joe and I theme. Okay, now... She thinks he's talking about flowing water, physical water still. So she's still operating on that physical, natural level. But Aquinas makes a great point here. He says, this is a great quote. The course of material water is downward. And this is different from the course of spiritual water, which is upward. So hence our Lord says, give me a drink. If you would have said to me, give me a drink, I would have uh, given you living water. Okay, and what does he say about that living water down below? He says, the water I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Welling up. I love this. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas makes this comparison between physical or material water and spiritual. The spiritual water he's describing here, the life in the spirit, has an upward trajectory uh, different from... Uh, the course of material water, which is downward, all right? That's why water is so humble. It always goes down. 
of spiritual water. Now, we got to talk about this spirit and this new exodus. You know, you got a major theme we got to deal with here, kind of like the history of Samaria. We got to spend some time on the spiritual nature of what it is our Lord's talking about here, very similar to the born of water and the spirit when we went through uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3. We got to deal with this a little bit here. Uh, and we're probably going to repeat some of the texts uh, that we've already looked at, but repetition's good. So first off, let's just skip ahead to John chapter 7, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which involves pouring of water onto the altar so that it spills out, runs out on the floor as a symbol of uh, Ezekiel 47. And uh, the this uh, water flowing out from the temple of God from the, in heaven, ultimately, but it's likened to earth because it flows into the eastern district. Okay, what's due east of Jerusalem? The Dead Sea. The lowest place on the face of the earth, BTW, that you could possibly go in case you're on jeopardy or something. Okay, it's the lowest place you can go on the face of the earth is the Dead Sea. Isn't that interesting? And an apt symbol uh, for Ezekiel's prophetic vision here of this temple and this water flowing out from the threshold of the temple toward the east because the temple faced east. And it goes down into this sea, this salt sea, and wherever this, this fresh water comes, it turns this dead salt water, uh, makes it fresh, and everything thrives. So... That's really what's happening on a spiritual level to this lady. You know, she's in a very dark and uh, desolate place. She's in a very low place. And uh, uh, our Lord is giving her a drink, ultimately, that's going to go down into the depths of her soul and purify all these dead salt marshes where nothing lives uh, in her soul. Uh, it's going to spring to life. And she's going to be so joyful that she's going to leave her watering pot there. Forget why she even came and go evangelize the whole town. So incredible transformation here. Uh, but it's kind of prefigured in Ezekiel 47 here. Uh, this incredible description of the, uh, the stream of water. It starts out as a little trickle and becomes a stream and finally a mighty river. Okay. And fruit trees spring up on every side of it. You hear... This uh, repeated in the book of Revelation's description of heaven. Okay, now, uh, healing in its rays, this uh, fruit shall be for food and their leaves for healing. Um, anyway, so now uh, this is a text, uh, Ezekiel 47, that you use for, it's an option for baptism. Okay, and there are connections to baptism, I should mention. Uh, we'll see that as we work our way through these uh, spirit and water texts from the scriptures. Dr. John Bergsma feels very strongly that uh, we should read the wedding, the um, this encounter uh, with the woman at uh, at the well, the Samaritan woman, in that context of baptism. Uh, so we'll start there with Ezekiel 47. And relating it to uh, John chapter 7. So they're kind of, in John chapter 7, they're kind of uh, representing, you know, anticipating this outpouring of, of water, okay? And from God's temple in heaven, this spiritual renewal, they're anticipating it uh, by reenacting it uh, in a... In a you know, anticipatory way. Um, this is something that, uh, it's a very interesting thing that the Jews do. It's like a prophetic reenactment in an anticipatory fashion of what they're longing for, what they desire. And in the midst of this, on the great day of the feast, the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed in John chapter 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. So all of us will become this temple. This is exactly what's happening uh, to this woman. Okay. Um, now, 
Let's go ahead and read that uh, this paragraph, this a paragraph from the Catechism. We're going to look at paragraph twenty-five, sixty. Um, so this is the one I was I had already made mention of. But uh, if you knew the gift of God, yeah, what is that gift? It's the Holy Spirit. The wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well, where we come seeking water. There, Christ comes to meet every human being. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Let that sink in. God has a passionate desire for us. God is thirsting for you he is thirsting for me it's just something we needed to take to prayer whether we realize it or not prayer is the encounter of god's thirst with ours god thirsts that we may thirst for him now um the psalms have beautiful imagery of thirsting for Almighty God. We'll stop off at uh, Psalm 36 first. Verses 8 and 9. They feast on the abundance of thy house, and thou givest them drink from the river of thy delights. It's literally the word Eden. Okay. For with thee is the fountain of life. And in thy light do we see light. With thee is the fountain of life. So really, this all relates back to Eden. So I like the fact that uh, literally in Psalm 36 here, um, the word delights is Eden, okay? Um, the paradisal garden. So this, um, the temple is kind of like a little micro Eden. It's supposed to be. It has a lot of Edenic imagery built into it you know um it's supposed to be like a little mini garden of eden and it really has uh and it's not just israel there's lots of temples and pagan cultures too that kind of pick up on this theme this paradisal garden like theme and there were usually trees you hear descriptions in the psalms like psalm 52 verse 8 uh, like a green olive tree in the house of God. You know, we descriptions of, of trees in God's garden. Presumably in the courtyard around the temple, there were trees planted, at least in the first temple. Um, and that's important. Uh, again, as kind of a symbol of the Garden of Eden uh, that it is supposed to be. And what was in the Garden of Eden? Well, there was tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, and a river, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and then it divided and became four rivers. Uh, so this primordial spring of water, flowing water, okay, zoe water flowing up out of uh, God's temple in uh, Ezekiel 47, is it just really, ultimately, um, relates to this original river of water flowing out of uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, this primordial flow of water. Um, so Psalm 36, powerful description of that very thing. And referring it to... Uh, the river of thy delights, for with thee is the fountain of life. Skipping ahead to chapter, uh, to Psalm 42, one we're all familiar with here. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My soul, let me go back to verse 1. As a heart longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You know, our body thirsts. The Gatorade expression, you know, deep down body thirst. Well, we all have a deep down soul thirst. 
The only thing that's going to quench it is God himself. Um, the spirit of life flowing from the Garden of Eden. Now let's look at Psalm 63. Similar here. Um, o God, thou art, my, thou art my God, I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh faints for thee. As in a dry and weary land where no water is. So I have looked upon thee in the sanctuary beholding thy power and glory because thy steadfast love is better than life. Wow. Um, even our flesh faints for the Lord. So it's a deep down body and soul thirst. Ultimately, I like that. Somehow it's even physical. It's even a physical longing or thirst. Our body is longing or thirsting for God along with our flesh, or I mean our spirit. Now, uh, let's look at some of the prophets. This is one we hear every year at the uh, Easter Vigil, and that's Isaiah chapter 12. It's an incredible description of like this new exodus, okay? Uh, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Um, and another one here, 3215. Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. So what is the context of this? Is really a messianic age of renewal in chapter 33. And uh, so what is this king of righteousness? Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. And, um, and then what is the fruit of that? reign of this king of righteousness until the spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field um, all right another one uh, it's good stuff chapter 32 verse uh, I'm sorry uh, chapter 41 verse 17 and following um so the poor and the needy seek water. When the poor and needy, which is all of us, we're all poor and needy, folks. Um, when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and valleys in the midst of the, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. So there's a great exodus theme here. And the dry land springs of water. Um, that men may see and know and may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. I love it. All right. The Holy One of Israel. All right, now, uh, 44, verse 3, we've already read uh, when we were talking about Israel and Jacob. Uh, but let's hear it again. Now hear, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord, who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. I will pour water on the thirsty land the stream and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Um, all right, now let's look at a couple more. 58, um, 58, 9, and 11. Um, if you do... Uh, Yeah, this is interesting. He's just, you know, this is the passage about fasting, what the Lord desires. The true fast is, uh, you know, to take care of the poor and needy. 
and to clothe the naked and so on. And uh, if you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger like Adam and Eve and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, I like that, kenosis, you know, pouring yourself out, then God will pour back to you. Um, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then shall your light arise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things. And make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden. Like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Wow. Um, Ezekiel 36 We've all heard this one many times. It's a very famous and important one here. Um, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. And a new spirit I will put within you and I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in in my statutes so once again sprinkling of water and the spirit and a new heart ezekiel 36 now ezekiel 39 29 and i will not hide my face anymore from them when i pour out my spirit upon the house of israel and I already uh, touched on Ezekiel 47, so we can skip that uh, and look at Z Zechariah. Zechariah 14:8. Uh, um, on that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and uncleanness. And then 14.8, on that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. And it shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will become king over all the earth on that day. The Lord will be one and his name one. Joel, we're all familiar with, because it's what Peter quotes at uh, Pentecost. And um, Joel 2. Um, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All right. Um, the Song of Songs is what I want to look at next. So what I want to explore now uh, that we've kind of soaked, as it were, in these um, images of, of thirst and fountains and water and cosmic renewal and... Um, you know, new exodus and life springing up in the desert. You know, uh, it's just in the wilderness. Um, there's a marital dimension to fountains as well. Uh, so let's look at that in what else but the Song of Songs. So um, here's some beautiful imagery here now. Uh, we're going to look at Song of Songs chapter 4. Verses 12 and 13. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A garden locked, a fountain sealed. So romantic, spousal, nuptial, marital imagery here in the Song of Songs. Love poetry. So there's something beautiful here. A spiritual romance going on right now between our Lord and the Samaritan woman at the well that's so holy and transcends any um, stupid um, pickup scene at a wa modern watering hole, which is a bar. Okay, what's happening is, is so superior to that, so transcendent. Um, this is the ultimate romance, that all those things just bear the merest resemblance. Okay, often a distorted resemblance in the modern hookup scene. Okay, but uh, our Lord here is, is entirely pure and chaste in his pursuit or his romance 
wooing, as it were, of this Samaritan woman as her God, as her creator, okay? Um, this is the marriage ultimately in Ephesians 5 of Christ and the church, of all of us, um, being wooed by our Lord. We are all of us a garden locked, a fountain sealed, a garden fountain, verse 15, a well of living water. Uh, so with the Song of Songs in mind, as you're reading uh, John chapter 4, um, you get the romantic feeling here um, of what's going on on the spiritual level, supernatural transcendent level. And that's what we're really longing for, ultimately, is our heavenly bride. Um, and that marriage, when all earthly marriages will end, it will continue and perdure for all eternity, the marriage to our heavenly bridegroom. Now, marriage to Christ. When we marry, we become one body, one flesh. Okay? And... Uh, when does this happen? When we're baptized, and that white garment symbolizes, and it has a nuptial dimension to it. Uh, that white garment, symbol, similar to, uh, I don't know, a bride's white wedding dress, okay? Um, and so how do we make the connection here? Because we're talking about drinking and thirst, so how does that relate to everything that's come before? Because there certainly, as Dr. John Bergsma points out, there's a strong motif of baptism that's been going on. John's already said that one's coming after me who will baptize with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then our Lord um, speaks to Nicodemus, about being again, being born again of water and the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. Clearly a baptismal reference. And then Jesus is baptizing, or the apostles, through his power or whatever. Okay, so we got a lot of baptism, baptismal, about strong baptismal motif leading up to this encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. So what we need to see is that the early church and we find in the scriptures uh, this spousal marital imagery that we see in the Song of Songs already uh, about, um, you know, the spousal nature uh, as one of being a fountain. Um, and um, what we want to see now is in Isaiah uh, 43 and 44, you know, clearly there was, as we went through that, images of drinking, okay, this uh, this water, um, this spirit. I will pour water on the thirsty land. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants. It's a spirit that we drink. Uh, for I give water in the wilderness. This is 43.20. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself. So this gift of the Spirit is to be consumed by drinking it. Uh, the imagery of drinking water as a way to receive the gift of the Spirit. And this has got to be connected to baptism. Uh, so... That's what we're going to see in St. Paul. So let's look at a couple Pauline texts where he certainly picks up on this. Ephesians 5, 18 first. Um, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, kind of a... In the context of drinking wine, it has a spiritual kind of sense to it. Uh, but here's the big one. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 makes what we're saying here extremely clear. For just as the body is one and has many members, so really this marriage with between Christ and the church, we become one body now. The church is his body. So that's the context of what he's talking about here, um, is this the church. It's ecclesiastical um, context here, talking about the church as the body of Christ. For just as the body is one and it has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, 
so it is with Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Okay. We became one body with our Lord. You know, in chapter six, he says, don't make, if the body's not made, meant for immorality before the Lord and the Lord for the body. Okay. Uh, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So we are one body and soul and spirit with the Lord. Uh, when we marry him by virtue of baptism. Uh, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or drink, and all slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So there you see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, a clear reference to baptism as a drinking of the spirit. When we are baptized, we drink of the spirit um those of us who are one body made to be one body with the lord we were made to drink of one spirit um pretty cool to think of uh, this whole samaritan woman at the well episode in the context of baptism i don't or, or i've never done that until I was preparing for this class and uh, saw all these connections and Dr. John Bergsma um, really developed that point. All right. Now she's had five husbands. So she, this is interesting. Uh, so she's got five husbands. Let's re let's read on um, a little bit more now. So I think I stopped at verse 15. Um, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Notice her willingness. You hear this in the fathers of the church. I forget which one. But, you know, Nicodemus, he didn't pounce on that. When our Lord said, you must be born again of water and the spirit. He's just asking questions like, how can that be so? You know, but he's not asking for this rebirth himself. Uh, there's something holding back in him. Whereas there's there's this like willingness. This this um, this woman is she's thirsty and deep down soul thirst. And she's poor and needy, and she wants this thing that our Lord describes to her. So just just notice the difference in the response between Nicodemus and this woman. She's in a from a coming from a place of greater poverty and neediness um, that's admirable. And there's all, she's altogether admirable in this story. Um, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now our Lord lowers the boom, drops a bomb on her. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. Or Baal, okay. And if this was Hebrew they were speaking, uh, you would say Baal. I have no Baal. Uh, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. So our Lord likes her honesty here. And our Lord responds to that. You got to lead with your weakness. You know, she's transparent. The Lord can't deal with us unless we're honest and open. So, yeah, our Lord's digging on this. And she just comes right out and says that I have no husband. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So what's interesting there, forget who said this. Oh, Dr. Bergsma, uh, he was saying, you know, this is interesting deflection on her part. He kind of hit her where she lives, you know, go call your husband. You're right in saying you have no husband. You've had five husbands and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And she shifts to a theological question, you know, it's like, ooh, 
Ouch. Hit me where I live. Um, now she's like, well, wait a minute. What, what, what's this business about? You know, you got your mountain. We got ours. You know, you say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And we say here on Mount Gerizim. You know, it's just interesting, like, kind of deflection. Um, let's talk theology. Don't don't get to, uh, ouch, you know. Um, now, um, so her personal marital history, we've already gone over that, uh, resembles uh, those five peoples that the Assyrians settled in Samaria. So very interesting. And the five male gods in first, first Kings 17. So uh, second Kings 17. Um, very interesting. Um, you know, but our Lord is the bridegroom here. That's what's so beautiful. Ultimately, the one speaking to her is the bridegroom. As we've already seen, John's told us in 329, he who has the bride is the bridegroom in the previous chapter. Perfect lead up to this encounter with the Samaritan woman. Explicit reference to our Lord as the bridegroom who has the bride. Um, yeah, I think we've already looked at some of these things, but I guess we can look at it again. Hosea. Powerful, powerful passage here in Hosea chapter 2. Um, in that day, says the Lord, you will, you will call me my husband. And no longer shall you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from your mouth. And they shall be mentioned by name no more. And I will make for you a covenant on that day. All right, I will betroth you to me forever. And you shall know the Lord. Um, that's important. You shall know the Lord. The word in Hebrew, yada. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's Greek here. It's Gnosko. When he says to her, um, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. So he wants her to have this knowledge of the Lord. Uh, as the water covers the earth back in Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, the Messiah, the root of Jesse is going to come and he's going to bring this knowledge of the Lord for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right. Um, he wants her to know the Lord God uh, and to be, to have her marriage regular, regularized. Okay. Uh, with God. Now, we can also, yeah, let's just stop there. So, they're living, you know, they they were taught to fear the Lord in 2 Kings 17. But just to revisit that, they had all these other gods, the Samaritans, and they also feared the Lord. They fear the Lord, but also serve their own gods. So, they're not really married to the Lord. Now, uh, she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. And uh, changes the topic. All right. Now, um, she gets into this whole business of this mountain versus that mountain. The Samaritan temple that used to be on Mount Gerizim was destroyed by John Hyrcanus, one of the Maccabees, in 128 B.C. by this Jewish king. Okay. And... But there's people that were worshiping on Mount Gerizim uh, at the time of Christ. And there are people that worship on Mount Gerizim to this day. There are still like 600 and some Samaritans, you know, uh, that worship um, in Samaria. To this day, there's still a number of them. Uh, so this is still an active religion. Um, so they continue to worship there. Now... This business of what you have known, what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. That's so interesting. Times of ignorance God has overlooked. You know, they're in a state of ignorance. I'm just thinking of Paul's words in the Areopagus of Acts chapter 17. 
He's trying to tell these guys, these knuckleheads there. Uh, look, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Right? The one true and living God right, uh, is who you should be worshiping. It's like, uh, you know, St. Paul here, and he's in Lystra right before they stone try to kill him with rocks. Uh, but he says, man, why are you doing this? You know, they try to worship him. They say he's Hermes and, and uh, uh, Barnabas is Zeus. And I love St. Paul here. He says, man, why are you doing this? We also are men of like nature with you and bringing you good news that you should turn from these vain things, which is just empty things, to a living God who made the heaven and the earth. That's the one true and living God and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. All right, so, um, and they try to kill him. All right, look, uh, this is so fascinating, this idea of knowledge. I think it does relate to the marital context because the marital act, Adam knew his wife, Eve. It, it also is an elastic term, an umbrella term that, um, uh, also has a spousal connotation in terms of carnal union, knowledge. Um, so look, um, they're worshiping what they do not know. They don't know. Why? Well, because, I don't know, you're, you're not in a real covenant relationship with the one true and living God, and these idols are, this is vain. They're empty. They're uh, they don't exist. Uh, Jeremiah 7, 9. Will you steal? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he just, you know, speaks of, uh, you go after other gods that you have not known. Jeremiah says something very similar. Um, yeah. Anyway, and uh, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 44.3 in Jeremiah. Let's see what that says here. Because of the wickedness which they committed, provoking me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and serve other gods that they knew not. So this is basically idolatry that we're talking about here. And there's lots of passages we can look at. Tons of them. Uh, let's speak of idolatry. Um, but I'm not going to go through all of them. There's just too dang many. Uh, but uh, idolatry ultimately amounts to emptiness and nothingness. And that point's made again and again and again and again in the Old Testament. Um, so... can't know an idol no matter how moved you are that's the thing that hurts our modern sensibilities if somebody's worshiping a false god something that is not a god if something's practicing somebody is practicing idolatry in the strict sense in our modern time what's interesting about that is that uh, that would be frowned upon to say such a thing and to say there is no there is salvation in no one else like Peter before the Sanhedrin there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we are to be saved there is salvation in no one else and God desires all men to come to come to salvation uh, what does St. Paul says God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth, our Lord's going to tell her. The time is coming. The one true and living God is, is disclosing himself to the whole world. Wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth is important to God. He desires us to worship him in spirit and truth. He desires us to know him, the one true and living God. That's why he's made himself close to us. God 
uh, with us. And what happens, though, is, you know, people are offended because, you know, you had somebody who's uh, Hindu or something, they're worshiping some false god. And they have an image of this god or they worship some other pagan god and they have a little totem and a little image, a little idol, and they bow down to this god. Um, look, uh, they don't truly know that god. They can't because it doesn't exist. And even if they are moved within themselves, um, how can we judge another person in their spiritual experience? Well, St. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12 too. You know that when you were heathen, you were led astray to dumb idols. However you may have been moved, however you may have been moved, inwardly moved, okay, by the experience of bowing down before an altar, okay, you still didn't know who you were worshiping in the strict sense because they don't exist. And that's just not adequate. We can't just, uh, you know, God is real. Reality is real. God is the author of reality. And he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants us all to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. God desires that all men be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth, the true and living God. Okay. Yada wants us to know him. Um, salvation, dare we say it, is from the Jews. We already saw, yeah, um, it's from the Jews. I mean, we can go back to Genesis uh, 49, verse 10, or 8 to 12. And we can see there that incredible, profound statement about uh, of Jacob when he blesses Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. And to him belongs the obedience of the nations, of all the nations. Incredible statement. A universal king ruler is going to come and he's going to come from the tribe of judah all the way back in genesis salvation is from the jews the tribe of judah here they call jacob their father she calls jacob her father and what does jacob do he singles out judah the tribe of judah one day there will come forth from this tribe of Judah, one to whom the obedience of the nations will be directed. Uh, the scepter shall never depart from Judah. Now, um, anything else I want to say about that? I wanted to highlight Psalm 76, verse 2 real quick. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem and his dwelling place in Zion. Um, so in Judah, God is known. Um, all right, now, uh, we're at 58 minutes. Do I want to... Let me finish up this last little bit because I think I already touched upon this. But God is not confined to a place. You know that Assyrian king, he sent the priest back, you know, uh, to teach them the ways of the Lord, the God of the land. God is not tied to a place. Okay, when our Lord says to the uh, Samaritan woman here, you know, the, the day is coming when people aren't going to worship on this mountain, that mountain. They're going to be worshiping all over the planet. Okay, in spirit and in truth, because that's who God desires to worship him. Um, you, uh, the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Um, God is not confined to a place. 
you know, even when Solomon builds the temple, listen to what he says. This is fascinating. Uh, Solomon says, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Um, that's not the verse I wanted. 1 Kings 8, 27. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. Okay. So this is development here. Spirit and truth. Not this mountain, not that mountain. Everywhere in the world, uh, our Lord is coming to usher in a new age of worship and knowledge of the living God. It's going to cover the earth like water covers the sea. That's what the root of Jesse is going to bring about. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right. Um, love it. Now, our Lord's body is the true temple. So wherever you have the Eucharist, you have the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Okay, so God, God's temple is now here on earth in the form of the Eucharist. Wherever the Eucharist is reserved is God's holy temple. And those of us who consume his body and blood become the temple. Anyone to whom the Lord lives inside um, is the temple of God, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Okay, we're all the temple of God now. So it's not this mountain, that mountain. And wherever the Eucharist is, God, our Lord, is there. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Okay? He was speaking of the temple of his body, John clarifies, back in chapter 2. All right? So, look. Um, this is the worship God desires. Spirit and truth. Let's talk about spirit. First Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is what God desires. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, Cast them into hell. Um, that can't be right. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Come to him, to that living stone, rejected by man, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. And like living stones, be yourself built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. All right, so a spiritual temple now spans the whole earth where people worship in spirit and in truth. We become living stones and offer spiritual sacrifices. And we are built up into a spiritual house. So not Mount Gerizim and not Mount Zion. All of us are part of this spiritual house now. That's the way the church begins to unpack and unravel this mystery. Uh, that All right, now let's look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. Da -da 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 -da. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's profound ecclesiology here about the temple. Let's close out this spiritual uh, reflection on the church here, this uh, worship in spirit, uh, by reading a catechism paragraph, 1179, the worship in spirit and in truth of the new covenant is not tied exclusively to any one place. The whole earth is sacred and entrusted to the children of men. 
What matters above all is that when the faithful assemble in the same place, they are the living stones gathered to be built into a spiritual house. First Peter. For the body of the risen Christ is the spiritual temple from which the source of living water springs forth. Incorporated into Christ by the Holy Spirit, we are the temple of God. All right. Now, um, truth. I already mentioned 1 Timothy 2.4. Um, send forth your light and your truth. You know, God, truth is important. Truth is important. All right. Um, I believe whatever you want. It's only important that we love. Yes, love is important. We can have all truth and knowledge and blah, blah, blah. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we can have all knowledge of the truth. If we have not love, it's worth nothing. Um, so, yes, that's absolutely true. But God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Truth is important. God wants us to know him truly. He does not want us to persist in error. Um, so, uh, Psalm 145, verse 18. Um, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. In truth. All right. Now, um, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, She's going to say, uh, hold on, we have heard the Messiah is coming, and I already made mention this is probably Tehave. Tehave is probably what she said. It's unlikely, maybe, she made a concession to the fact that he's a Jew and spoke in Jewish terminology. Um, but anyway, it's very interesting. Um, this little exchange, the woman said to him, after he says all this business about spirit and truth, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Hmm. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. All right. Yes, you can translate it, ego, amy, as I am he. Okay, but really in a strict sense, it's I am. Uh, I who speak to you, I am is what it says literally in the Greek. Now you can stick a pronoun in there if you want, say, I am he. Uh, but that's really not in the Greek literal translation. It's just I am, okay? The I am statements are all throughout John's gospel. Okay, so uh, that's probably the way it really needs to be translated. When you say I am, you're calling to mind Exodus 3.14. This is... One of the books of the Pentateuch, the book of Exodus that um, the Samaritans adhere to. And this is their God. And this is our Lord himself. I am Yahweh. I am who I am. He's disclosing to her. Um, right. And this is one of the clear instances where he says specifically that he is the Christ. He also says it in Mark's gospel, where he uses that same language, I am, okay? When they ask him in Mark's gospel, are you the Christ? Are you the king of the Jews? Uh, and he answered, I am. Uh, hold on. Mark 14, 61 to 62. Yeah, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed and Jesus said, I am, ego, Amy. I am. So these are two explicit references where Christ claims to be the Christ in what many believe to be the first gospel ever written, Mark, in 14, 61 to 62. And then here in John chapter 4, he tells the woman of Samaria, I am, I am the Christ. All right, um, almost done. Um, you know, it's a very mysterious thing, this I am business. So I wanted to read a passage from the Catechism while we're thinking and talking about this because 
you start talking about the divine name, ooh, the bottom drops out. So we need to kind of, as we go through John and we hear this more and more and more, this I am business, ego, Amy, all these I am statements. Just notice that in revealing his mysterious name, Yahweh, I am who is, I am he who is, or, or I am who am, or I am who I am. It's a tricky thing to translate. God says who he is and by what name he is to be called. This divine name is mysterious, just as God is mystery. It is at once a name revealed and something like a refusal of a name. Which is a very interesting biblical theme we don't have time to go into right now. But a name and a refusal of a name. And hence, it better expresses God as what he is, infinitely above everything that we can understand or say. He's the hidden God. His name is ineffable. And he is the God who makes himself close to men. So it's an astounding thing when our Lord says, I am in John's gospel. You cannot, uh, you know, he has his own name. Look at Revelation 19, 12. It's like, look, he has a name inscribed. This, you know, Jesus is being described in chapter 19 on a white horse. And uh, he is the word of God. The, the Logos here and uh, his robe is dipped in blood and he has a name inscribed which no one knows but himself. Next time, uh, we'll pick up with her leaving her water jar and going into town. You know, and just as the apostles arrive and our Lord's dialogue with the apostles, and we'll kind of wrap up this whole Samaritan business and then our Lord's going to Go to Cana, and he's going to heal the official's son. So hopefully I, we should be able to get uh, the rest of chapter 4 done next time. Until then, God bless you.